Okay, so last time I left off laying out the discrete log problem and we were about here and so I had 7 as my prime number and 3 as my primitive and I found that 3 was a primitive root of 7. Uh, just a note here, I put a this equal sign should not be there, right? We just have 3 to the i mod 7 equals 6 and I don't know what i is without pre-computing this whole table in advance. So that's the hard problem of the discrete log. So we tried a equals 4 there. We found two primitive roots of 7, 3, and 5, and then just showed that there's actually lots of primitive roots of prime numbers. So it's not straightforwardly obvious if you have a massive prime, prime number which the primitive roots are without doing all the calculation. Okay, so the obvious question comes up next, which is how can I use this? What can I do with it? So I've just got the same table here as we had before. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to set this up so that we have two people and we're each going to do a calculation and then we're going to end up exchanging numbers that we calculate uh, and that's going to be the basis for an encryption key. So I'm going to start by picking a number. So I'm going to pick i equals 3 as my exponent and Alice, who I'm going to swap with, is going to pick i equals 2. Uh, next up we're each going to do a computation uh, that we've already done, but I will write it out again. So what I'm looking for is there's my number 3. I've already chosen 3 and 7 in advance, so I'm just going to compute 3 to the 3 mod 7, um, so that's 27, or I could look up here and see that it is 6. And I'll do the same thing for Alice. And so she's looking for 3 squared mod 7, so that's 9 mod 7, and that equals 2. Uh, again, this 2 is found right here in the table. Okay, so now I'm going to execute the swap, or, uh, you know, this is uh, the important part of the key exchange. So y equals 6 is going to come down over here, and this y is Jeff's, so maybe put a subscript there, uh, although I'm trying to use colors here to also differentiate. So this y, Alice, equals 2. So when you do this swap, I didn't know that Alice picked 2. This is just a coincidence that 2 came out to be 2. Right? And Alice doesn't know that I picked 3, but she is going to know that I'm going to send her 6. So now I'm going to do another modulo calculation. I'm going to compute um, y to the i. So this y is Alice's. I is mine, and then mod 7 is everyone's. So 8 mod 7 comes out to be 1. Uh, now Alice is going to do the same. Let's see if I can get the colors right. She's going to put in her eye, and then mod 7 is everyone. So Jeff's 6, Alice's i, mod 7. So now we actually have a new calculation. We haven't, we haven't done this one before. We have 6 squared. Uh, so 36 mod 7. Uh, 7 times 5 is 35. So the left over here is 1. And so straight away I'm thinking, hey, hang on, Jeff also found one, right? And so between these two, this is not a coincidence, right? And we have both calculated now the same secret value. 
that we can use then to proceed with our encryption. And some exclamation points for emphasis, right? So using this modular arithmetic, uh, you know, and some clever features about the discrete log here, we've both been able to calculate the same key. And again, so we now have shared information of one, but Jeff, myself, I used Alice's two, but I didn't know the original value Alice picked. That was just coincidence. And Alice didn't know that I picked originally three because I sent her a six. So I also didn't reveal any private information in this exchange. Without, re without revealing my original values. Okay, the shared secret can be that secret key in symmetric cryptography. So now I've managed to send the key. It's not sending. Now I've managed to let Alice know the key. And what we can do is we can both go to some online forum. We can both share a shared password on an email account and communicate privately. Whereas before, you know, locks and boxes have been around since humans started making things, right? Um, the way that you would have to do this type of thing before uh, the math that we just saw, which I will attribute in a moment, um, you physically had to send someone to another location to get them the secret key, right? If it's like a, if it's like a cipher and you've got some text that is the key that allows you to decrypt, you have to get them that cipher. And you know, in war times, which now make for good movies and stories, you know, in war times, this was a whole business, right? The business of spying, stealing codes, and being able to deliver codes to generals and submarines and thing, things like this. Um, because if you intercept the messenger, you can just read the key and nobody knows, right? All they know is that the key got lost. But here now we know that you have this way without leaking information in order to generate that secret key between two parties. Uh, attributed to, uh, well, it's known as the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. What I just wrote here where Jeff and Alice swap, that's uh, the key exchange, and that happens in, in computing where your device connects to a server, a certificate authority, and you exchange keys. Uh, and so Whit here, this is uh, Whitfield Diffie, and the Hellman there is Martin Hellman, uh, and basically two parties can generate the same secret key you can publicly swap the information uh, and be assured that it's difficult to reverse engineer. Uh, and eavesdropping does not matter. So shortly after Diffie-Hellman published this, there's a link in the notes. Uh, the paper is called New Directions in Cryptography. Uh, it's uh, like a lot of the papers back in the day. It's like a short paper and sort of uh, straight to the point. Uh, and, you know, I was saying earlier about like, you don't know until many years later if what you did was worthwhile. This is one of those things that has emerged. Um, and so, very famous paper, and you know, we still use the mathematics that are in it today. Very quickly afterwards, uh, asymmetric cryptography was developed. You've probably heard of RSA encryption. So RSA encryption is another crypto system that isn't necessarily used uh, as frequently in, for example, Bitcoin or in blockchains but it is used frequently in computing. So RSA, uh, the R is Ron Rivest and uh, Adi Shamir and uh, Adelman, forget his first name. So three guys, R, S, and A. And it was very short after Diffie published his paper, people were like, whoa, this opens up a whole new, uh, a whole new way to look at creating these, uh, these difficult two-way problems. So one way is easy to calculate or verify, the other way is difficult to solve. Uh, so asymmetric cryptography is where we have a public and a private key. We can see them here through our key generation program. Um, and actually, the public key should be derived from the private key. But this is the diagram on Wikipedia, so I, I copied it. I might draw mine a little bit differently. Um, so the two keys allow you to do something unique in that you can um, encrypt with both your private or your public key. So you can encrypt using your private key, and then anybody else with your public key can read the message. 
But similarly, you can sign messages for digital signatures, uh, and that is something that you also uh, is also quite common. So what do we have here? Uh, Bob sending a message. So Alice publishes her key. Sometimes this is shortened to pub key for public key. Alice publishes it, and Bob can just pull the key off the message board, send her a message. Alice uses her own private key to decrypt. So it's still Bob and Alice, but they didn't have to go through the key exchange together, right? Um, and this is sort of a many to one type of mapping. Many people can message Alice, like a public email address, but only Alice can decrypt those individual messages. So we don't have the time here to go through it, but um, I encourage you to look it up. RSA is based on prime numbers and based on the prime factorization problem, where it's easy to multiply two numbers together but it's hard to take a big number and figure out the factors in that number. So uh, by big number, I mean like the number 12, right, has the factors 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 12, has all the factors of 12. Um, 12 is not a prime number, right? The number 17 has 1 and 17 as the, as the factors. So if you take two big pseudo primes, which mean that they're almost prime, uh, and, or, I got that backwards. You take two big primes and you multiply them together, you get a very, very big pseudo prime number. And it's very hard to find those individual factors from that big prime number. And so that's what the RSA mathematics is based on. So it's a different tack than the discrete logarithm, which we just saw, which lends itself to elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, so I should say that on this slide here. So ECC is based on the discrete logarithm problem, and RSA is based on prime number factorization. We can see some of the security here. For approximately the same security, meaning how long does it take a modern computer to brute force um, the key? We can see that, can you see my, yeah. So we can see that uh, elliptic curve has a much smaller key size than RSA at 3,000. Uh, even smaller is AES, but that is a symmetric system, so you have to do the key exchange. Um, and so this is why more modern systems are using elliptic curve cryptography, is because it's a bit more efficient in key size. It's not necessarily that the mathematics is any more or less secure.